Michael Smith, a digital sculptor from New York City. I teach at uh, New York Institute of Technology. And I've been working on a bio sculpture project that's based on an idea that I had over 20 years ago. And when I was watching TED.com uh, last spring, I saw the work that Dr. Anthony Atala was doing at Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I had my assistant get on the phone to Dr. Atala's assistant, and it was a nice surprise to have him accept a phone call. And that began this art science collaborative project we've been working on all summer, and we have just finished stage one. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Anthony Atala. Thanks Thank for you. being here today. And thanks for having us, and, and really thanks for making this sort of strange dream become possible. I, I've seen the TED.com lectures, and there's always the short bio, but it really wasn't very full in, like, who is Dr. Atala? Where did he come from? How did he gravitate to this very, very rare new field in medical research? Uh, trained to be a, a pediatric uh, urologic surgeon, and it was during that time that I ended up getting into this field that we now call regenerative medicine, which is really a field that aims to create tissues using the patient's own cells so that we can put them right back into the patient. And that's really what got me started in, in this field uh, over 20 years ago. I've been following the writings of Ray Kurzweil for at least a couple of decades, uh, certainly since um, his book, Age of the Spiritual Machines. In that book, he really places the, the 21st century as being about biomechanical, medical genetic research, uh, coupled with robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnologies. I was drawn, of course, and found you online through that kind of research. What kind of background influenced you to move into that direction? As a surgeon, really, there's nothing more devastating than being in an operating room and knowing that you have to replace a piece of tissue, but you don't have any good choices. And you have to use a piece of plastic or a piece of metal to put into a patient that you know is not going to be the best option. Mm -hmm. Now often that works out well for the older patient, but it doesn't work very well for a, an infant or a baby who has an, uh, 80 years or 90 years uh, of life uh, ahead of them. And so really the concept was very simple. If we are going to try to repair uh, these uh, patients surgically, and it, we need a piece of their own tissue to do so, and we know we don't have any available from the patient, why don't we just make some so we can put it right back in? And that's really how we got started. We're dealing with life-saving technology here, certainly life-saving towards the future, but I was trying to put myself in your position, and suddenly this, this artist from Manhattan calls you on the phone, and basically tells you he wants to make sculptures out of this uh, technology that otherwise is used for saving lives, not for inventing new forms. Well, I was certainly very intrigued by the concept. I mean, you know, f of course we're making these constructs all the time, <clears throat> but we're making these constructs for uh, a purpose, which is, you know, we have in mind to treat patients who may have a certain condition, and we're going to try to print print a specific type of tissue that will fit that patient, like an ear, for example, or the piece of a nose or an organ. And that's what we do every day. When I heard you on the other end of the line, I uh, heard your thoughts on, on what you were doing. Uh, you were an academic colleague, if you will. You are teaching at an academic institution, just like we are here at an academic institution. And certainly for the pursuit of advancements, whether it be in the science or the arts, these type of things are, are worthwhile projects to pursue. Have you been approached in the past by an artist to do an art science collaboration? We actually have had art science collaborations in the area of photography, for example, but not really in the area of sculptures. So this was the very first time that that had uh, come up. In the TED.com presentation, you introduced a young fellow from a uh, college in Connecticut who was, as I understand, someone who received a bladder when he was much younger, so now he's living a, a much more normal, uh, productive life. I, I understand that it wasn't the rapid prototype technology that did that, but it's, it seems to me like it's a precursor because it was a constructed part. Is that correct? 
we had uh, Lucas Masella came up for the talk. It was really the very first time I was seeing Lucas after 10 years. I hadn't seen him since he had his surgery. Uh, followed his progress, but uh, at a distance. We ended up engineering the organ for him. It's been 11 years now. We basically took a very small piece of his uh, uh, injured or deceased organ. We harvested the normal cells, grew and expanded the normal cells outside the body, and we then used three-dimensional molds which were preformed first, and we then added the cells to the mold, allowed the cells to form new tissue, and we then implanted the organ back into, into Lucas and patients like him. That was the technology. So really the technology is very similar to what we're doing today. It's just how do you scale it up, right? That was making one organ at a time by hand. Right. So the, the concept was, well, how do we scale it up so we can make many of these at the same time? And that's really how bioprinting uh, was the next option for us. Obviously, you're making parts, so we see examples of them here. Have any of them made their way into a patient yet? Or, and if not, when would we expect that to happen? Yeah, so certainly the handmade uh, constructs, we have now many different types of tissues and organs that we've already put into patients over the last decade. And that includes flat structures and tubular structures and hollow non-tubular structures. The goal is really to scale it up. And so that's where this technology comes in. Using the scale-up technology, we have not done it yet in a patient because we really have not had the need to do so. Mm -hmm. We're still making these organs one at a time for these clinical trials. Uh, and the hope is that as we scale up the production of these technologies, that we can actually use bioprinting to make it happen. We met Dr. Kang here. It was a nice surprise to find out that he built this machine, and this is a one and only unique machine. I'm, I'm aware that there are some production models out there, but I gather they're nowhere near as sophisticated as these. Yeah, we actually started designing these machines uh, in over a decade ago. We started by modifying existing printers, like your typical desktop inkjet printer that you may have at your home. The difference was that we used uh, print cartridges, but instead of using ink, we would use cells mm -hmm. in these uh, cartridges. And uh, really just when I went on to designing more sophisticated printers until we now have you know, something like this, which is very sophisticated, where we can print down to a very small level of detail. The way that we print these structures is you're not just laying down the cells, you're laying down the cells and a gel with it and then the gel hardens, is very, the consistency of a gummy bear and with the cells within it and then what happens is the cells take over and they start growing while the gummy bear gel actually goes away and then you're left just with the cells uh, that have made the new tissue. Uh, so basically the construct gets uh, printed one layer at a time with the gel and the cells and then the gel gives the structure the, the three-dimensional form that it needs. And once we place these structures into the patient, these gel materials dissolve away mm -hmm. on their own, leaving just the new cells that are making the new tissue. So the cells form the new tissue, and once that happens, the gel goes away. It seems to me that something like implanting an ear would be a much easier sort of human test to accomplish even before you are putting something in, internal? Well, so the, the whole uh, concept is you create these three-dimensional structures uh, with the cells and you put them in the body and then the body will give it the rest of the life it needs. Blood vessels into it, the nerves will get into that structure and that will become permanent tissue in that patient. The gel goes away, but the tissue remains. I've been working with rapid prototype equipment for over 15 years, and some of it is quite refined, but I've never worked with a machine as refined as this one. It's, it's a piece of art itself as far as I'm concerned. You know, the, the challenge, of course, when you're dealing with human tissues is that you really do have to get down to a very small size, down to the size of a hair in terms of the structure. And to do that, you, as you know, you really need a lot more refined techniques, so that's why these printers are, are very, uh, very specialized printers, if you will. In terms of this project, there's a series of things that, that are going to need to be accomplished at different stages for me to achieve the final goal. Eventually, I, I really do want to land one of these things on Mars. 
and I, and I think that it's not anywhere near as crazy as it first sounds. I think it's actually quite doable, and it's doable within, I, I'm considering, a five to ten year time frame. Um, a number of things need to happen, and, and some of the more important things are these parts, these uh, organic parts alive for more extended periods of time, and then eventually to get them to start working together as uh, new forms. I'm not planning to implant things into human beings. I'm intending to create a sculptural form, which is, in essence, a Precambrian life form that happens to be wired up to uh, artificial intelligence so that it can work as a means to experiment what happens to human tissue when it's in extended space flight or when it's on another planet. What kind of time frame do you think is viable that we can actually see these parts be able to have an extended lifespan and maybe integrating capillary systems into them so we can start making more sophisticated organs? The goal we currently have is to create these structures which are fairly sophisticated with a, a capillary system, a blood vessel system that actually allows these structures to be fed. And that's really how they work once they get implanted into patients. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we talk about a sculpture, we're talking about something a little bit different because we are then not talking about hooking this uh, structure back into a patient. We are talking about having this structure be a free living form, which is what you're trying to attain. Certainly there are various mechanisms by which that can be accomplished. Uh, we use some of the same technologies now, of course, to keep our organs alive before we implant them. So we can use the same type of technology now to also keep these sculptures alive. The question is, can you keep these alive for long periods of time? We would have to modify our current technology to make that happen. And I did recently see some group, they feel like they've got the technology to start printing a capillary system inside. How much contact do you have with other groups in terms of integrating? We actually have a very large network of investigators and collaborators that we work with all over the world. We pretty much stay informed of everything that everyone's doing. We, we all go to the same conferences and go to the same venues where we exchange information. We currently have the ability to print the capillary systems. That's what we are doing now for the organs that we're implanting. But the difference is that when we're implanting this, this, this tissue or organ back into the body, the body will hook back up into it. Mm -hmm. It'll hook back up into that structure we're putting in and the blood vessels will then incorporate into the, this structure, this three-dimensional structure we just created. When you're talking about this art form that you are creating now with us, the difference is that by creating this art form, you're not really putting it back into a patient, and therefore you're relying on this structure to remain viable on its own over long periods of time. And we have the bioreactors now that can make that happen, but it is an expensive proposition. Have, have you experienced any negative response in terms of the research that you're doing? The goal of our research is really to bring these technologies to patients. And so what we do is we take a small piece of tissue from the patient, from the specific organ, and we then grow and expand those cells from that organ, and we then put them right back into the patient. So the, pa the cells come from the patient, the cells are tissue specific, we make the same tissue and put it right back into the patient. So we have not really had any ethical issues with doing that because in reality, they're the patient's own cells. And also, uh, you're avoiding rejection because you are using the patient's own tissue. So from our perspective, we are taking the tissue from the patient and put it right back into the patient and therefore, the patient has full uh, knowledge of what's going on. And of course, that's what they want to have done sort of joked a, a little bit, we sort of expect the, the peasants to come out with the pitchforks. There clearly is this kind of linkage to film, and, and, and it seems like an awful lot of um, reasonable scientific projections and ideas become science fiction, which gives it some hope, but it also always has some kind of horror built into it. It's entertaining, but it's also, I think, that it's, it's rather destructive in terms of being able to move forward and, and progress. It, it seems like, especially during the early part of the 20th century, scientists um, sort of got this bad name through these actors who were playing characters who were 
simply putting body parts together, which was uh, completely science fiction at, at that time, but obviously it's not science fiction any longer. We, we are in the realm of this is what's happening and this is what we're doing. And of course we have positive, beneficial ideas that we want to, to move forward with. When you are uh, exploring new venues in science, you always have to break through dogma. You know, there are things which uh, were not thought possible before. Just uh, 20 years ago, most cells from humans could not be grown outside the body. Just 15 years ago, the concept of having a stem cell that is a cell that could actually become different cell types was, was not even thought possible. So in science, you're constantly breaking down all barriers. And science, by its very nature, is a field which breaks down barriers to go into new horizons that lead to new discoveries all the time. Uh, that is less so in other areas, but we are used to having these thoughts which we, these barriers which, which we think are impossible to break. And as you know, in the history of time, science has broken through many of those barriers of to where we are today. And, and thankfully, we are all benefiting from these technologies today. We're living longer, we are, uh, uh, the disease is being detected earlier, and uh, we are uh, getting cures faster to patients all because of science advancing and breaking those unbreakable barriers. You, you seem to have been open to an art and science collaboration, so I'm, I'm making an assumption that you had some kind of cultural past. It is common for science and art to always be closely uh, related. Even though we are in different worlds, scientists enjoy the arts and it's something that we seek out. Scientists, by their very nature, are curious and like to explore. And certainly that's what I find in our team all the time, trying to explore new things. In reality, that's what you do every day in science. You're exploring new venues. You are searching out new outlets for discovery. In a way, that's what you, you yourself do in art. You're constantly trying to see in what direction you can go to improve the arts and make it better. So in a way, we have a lot of things in common. And so having a collaboration where uh, science and art come together to create this living sculpture, in a way, it's not that foreign to us. Okay. Had I not come forward with this idea do you think there's somebody in the science world that would have taken your idea and taken it a step away from, say, as a, a transplanted organ to the idea of creating something is more invented in terms of uh, form, uh, may have industrial purposes? Because obviously human cells and animal cells and plant cells could be combined in ways to create new types of materials. I mean, the, the the industrial possibilities the new materials is fairly unlimited here. Outside of science fiction, yeah. I haven't encountered anybody trying to do exactly what I'm trying to do, at, at least yet. Yeah, no, we have never encountered anything even close to what's being done here now. For us, I think it was also the element of you know, where science reaches out to the public at large, and art is often a good way to do that. When I first had this idea, as, as any artist would want to do a self-portrait, these creatures that I have in mind to build, and, and I've been designing these things in animation for over 20 years. The design work is, has really been done to a large degree. For me, it's going to be even more real when it's my DNA. I'm very, very pleased you were able to use research material for this project. One of the later stages, using one's own DNA is going to be necessary. Now, you told me that there was going to be a process, and I'm sure that there's, there's medical issues, there's financial issues, but also I'm sure that there are some legal issues. And I'm wondering what those steps and processes and what kind of projected timelines. Right now we're just using research tissue, but in order to use human tissue, you really are then bringing it to another level in terms of the protocols and appro approvals that need to occur. We have institutional policies, we have ethical policies. 
investigational review boards, ethic boards that you have to go through. Anytime you use human tissue, there are a lot of barriers that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily more expensive, it's just a longer process that you have to go through to do that. And of course, there has to be a, a reason why that needs to occur. It seems to me that almost all of us would want this done um, so that we can actually take advantage of this technology in the future. We would all have to have our DNA in, encoded or kept frozen and available to, to start growing so that we can have new parts made uh, at some point in the future. Well, certainly the hope from a clinical perspective is that uh, if a patient requires a tissue, we can just take a small biopsy of their tissue and, and grow out the organ and put it back in. Of course, that's what we've done clinically. We're just using the printing uh, technology to scale it up. But that's very different than actually trying to just create a sculpture. There's a fine line between the things that we do for therapy and what you may want to do for art. If you can print human cells, obviously you can print uh, animal cells, you could print plant cells, you could print a combination of all those things. You could take the best parts of each one of them and start combining them in, in ways that uh, could achieve new kinds of materials. Wouldn't clothes be much more uh, useful if they were like skins, literally like skins that we take on and off? If it's used for clothes, then it could be used for a variety of other things. It can be used for keeping people warm. It may be thinner materials that have better insulation, which then lends itself to construction. Once you open one door, it starts opening up a number of other doors. The perspective of using different cell types, the possibilities really are endless. Right, the question is, what would be the purpose of doing it? And would there be a, a, a use for it? Would there be something that you can use these technologies for? Would it be just for the arts? Would it be for science? And those are questions that we will need to explore as this technology evolves. This moves into the realm of what I do because sculpture is also architecture, right? Sculpture is also use of materials and materials become construction. Sculptural forms become fashion. This has the possibility of really expanding into a lot of fields very quickly. One of my interests as an artist to get involved here, yes, of course I want to make a sculpture and I want to make lots of sculptures and I want the sculptures to become more and more sophisticated with time. But I'm also conscious that I'm opening doors for other things and I want to be part of that conversation and part of that involvement. It's like anything else that you do for the very first time. There's this uh, very small idea that starts blossoming in your mind that takes on form and in this case it's a very real form, it's a sculpture. The next step uh, in terms of the art form will be, well, what do you do next with that? And I think those are important questions. I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. I was curious if you had any questions for me. Obviously, you came up with this concept over 20 years ago when you were working on a CD-ROM that uh, was looking at a game. Back then had this, this concept that we are doing right now, how does it feel for you to actually have had this science fiction concept 20 years ago that is now uh, really involving science? I've had the experience of going through this more than once already. In 1976, when I was a graduate student at San Jose State University, I met Stephen Jobs, who was living two miles away in a track house garage in Cupertino, and I was in Los Gatos. I, he was building the first personal computer with Stephen Wozniak. I was building my first sculptures. I got to listen to him try to convince the business majors in the dorms before anybody really knew who he was to go into this new field. I raised my head and said, well, I think this is all very cool, but I don't want to run a company. Uh, I don't want to write software. I don't want to build computers. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I, I'm an artist and I've started making sculpture. And he's going, oh, well, the real future of this stuff is 3D. I was in my early 20s at the time, and he said, well, in about 15 to 20 years, you'll be able to build in your own home, in your own computer, something similar to that new film. And he was referring to the very, very first Star Wars film, and he was, the TIE fighter scenes was the first use of 3D uh, visualization animation in a, a full-length feature film. Of course, in my early 20s, I was thinking, 
you tell me it's 15 or 20 years in the future, it's like telling me it's never going to happen. Somehow I got past that and I, I started tracking the technology. And sure enough, within 15 years, Autodesk came out with 3D Studio on DOS. It was a, a threshold I'd been waiting for, I'd been anticipating. So I was already there ready to start building as soon as it came in. And, and then when I ran a, worked on the CD-ROM game in the early 90s using that particular software, that's when I started writing this richer science fiction. I was finding more and more that I was coming up with these ideas and that in shorter and shorter periods of time, these things were starting to happen. So in the game, I had him making virtual sculptures. In the beginning, I thought, well, I waited 20 years to get to this point. I can wait another 15 or 20 years to get to making virtual sculptures. But in fact, it was only 15 to 20 months. It happened like that. And then once I satisfied that one, then I went on to the next one and it opened another door. I've kind of lived this life in the last few decades where I've been building content for media that don't exist yet. And I've been teaching design for the future. That's been my primary goal, mission, educational. I do have to say that printing a sculpture with human cells was really something that I thought the only way I was going to be able to do that is if Kurzweil was right and I was able to extend my life into maybe another millennium. So the fact that we've accomplished stage one of that is, it is like having your dreams come true and I really greatly appreciate that. Well, that's great. Well, it's been a pleasure working with you and I'm looking forward to see what else, uh, what else lies ahead.